Hello, you're listening to 37th and the World, the official podcast of the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs, the flagship academic publication of Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. On 37th and the World, we dive into crucial global trends and speak directly with experts working on issues ranging from security to the economy, technology to society, and more. In today's episode, we dive into the current crisis in Haiti with Johnny Celestin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be with you, Lisa, and I hope we're going to have a very rich conversation. Yes, I think we will. And I will start us off by providing a little bit of context for those who have not been following the circumstances in Haiti in the last couple of years. As many know, for for years, Haiti has been working to rebuild in the wake of a various, various security crises and the devastating 2010 earthquake just years back. More recently, however, widespread violence and humanitarian crises have unfolded following the, pre- the assassination of Haitian President Moises in July 2021, prompting our Ariel Henri to become the de facto leader. He ultimately has eliminated checks on his power, all while the terms of the members of elected national government have expired. No election has been held since, leaving Haiti without any elected members of government. In the wake of this, gang violence quickly has taken over the capital city and other parts of the country, where gangs currently control about 90% of the capital city, Port-au-Prince. Kidnappings and murders have skyrocketed, leaving Haitians stranded with little access to food and extremely vulnerable to the violence that gangs bring as they battle for control and to instill fear in communities. In the nearly two years since the assassination of President Moises, various gangs, ultimately funded by wealthy elites in the country, have collaborated to shut down access to the airport, ports, and more. And just in the last few weeks, one of the strongest gang leaders, Jimmy Cherizier, who's also known as Barbecue, has demanded a role in crafting what's next for Haiti's government. Before we dive into the current humanitarian crisis and security situation, Johnny, can you provide us with some historical and political context on the security and history of foreign involvement in Haiti? Sure, sure. Um, So I think most people would probably have heard of the U.S. invasion of Haiti in 1915 under the rationale that they gave for doing that, particularly because there was sort of insecurity and overthrow of the president at the time. Um, Of course, the U.S.'s relationship with Haiti is one that is longstanding. Um, Haiti has been um, one of those countries that, because of what it has done in 1804, has been shunned, and particularly shunned by the United States because it didn't want to have the sort of formerly enslaved people wanting to take um, their freedom. And so 1915 was the first time where physically the United States sort of entered into Haiti. But there were subsequent forces, particularly by the United Nations under Chapter 7, that entered the, entered the country in 1993. President Clinton in, in, in office um, after some negotiations with then uh, former President jean Bertrand Aristide, um, UN force went into Haiti, and these forces um, remain in Haiti until about 2000. Um, in 2004, so they were called. So there, there was another group of UN forces that entered Haiti under Chapter Seven again, 2004, um, and it was MINUSTA, which stayed from 2004 until 2017. Um, and MINUSTA uh, then sort of uh, was drawn down, and uh, it was re- replaced by a smaller. Uh, a, a force, uh, essentially, really the mission change to really support the Haitian justice system as well as um, the police, and so that turned into um, what we call mini just, you, you know, which is about justice. And that mission ended in 2019, and really, um, that's the period at which, after which, I think uh, uh, the gangs really begun to sort of, of course, with upheaval, and we'll talk more about those. Uh, begun to sort of take a foothold, a stronger foothold. They were always around, but a stronger foothold in the country. So multiple times in Haiti's history when the United States was either um, uh, remotely sort of uh, uh, influencing what was happening in the country or uh, directly involved in the country through um, forces being on the ground. And to your point, I think that that context is incredibly important, right? Because the The amount of controversy that has been steeped in some of these decisions for U.S. involvement, U.N. involvement in the country and the 
consequences that have come from that, either from the security situation or from the quality of life for Haitians on the ground. And that's been something that's been top of mind, I think, as leaders have asked themselves and what they should do in response to the current security crisis in Haiti. As we have, many have seen, the U.S., Canada, and other countries in North and South America have considered certain plans, but the U.S. and Canada have been very hesitant to send troops, for instance, but have been sending supplies. And we now see a new plan coming from Kenya to send forces to support the security situation in Haiti. Johnny, can you give us a little bit more detail on what this plan coming out of Kenya looks like and what the potential controversy or consequences of it might be, as well as what the perspective is on Haitians on the ground for having another uh, I think the first thing to sort of uh, look at is what is dubbed as the, the Kenyan plan, um, which is really, and unfortunately, and maybe fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, not really a Kenyan plan. So really, when things started to go really south in Haiti, there were a lot of advocacy um, to try to get the U.S. to intervene because the situation was um, becoming unbearable and being... Uh, only an hour and a half from the shore of the United States, many of us here in the United States and the diaspora felt that there, the U.S. could play a, a a positive role, unlike some of the roles that it played in the past. It could play a more positive role in what was happening in Haiti. Obviously, you know, as many of you who are students of international relations and affairs, you understand that the U.S. post President Trump's or during President Trump's and then post President Trump's presidency, we've been sort of much more isolationist. Um, you know, President Biden, you know, sort of moving out of Afghanistan, reducing our troop in Iraq. So there is no interest in the national sort of uh, psyche and willingness to really engage uh, uh, U.S. military and sort of external uh, footprint. So initially, the idea was what can U.S. military do to help stem the problem of gangs? But very quickly, we all realized, for those of us who follow this, understood that 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 was not a possibility. And the U.S. also, uh, uh, the policymakers also understood that this was not a possibility, hence why they were sort of going around trying to identify what other partners, and they've gone to a number of partners, including sort of your normal, they went to the U.N., China and Russia stood against that. They went to, you know, to do this sort of in a bilateral way. They tried to get Brazil, who had done uh, under Minista, most of the soldiers who were part of Minista was from Brazil. They really led that mission. They went to Brazil. Brazil said, no, thank you. They went to CARICOM. And of course, if you think about CARICOM, CARICOM, you know, of the, all the countries in CARICOM, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Cuba have the most sort of, had the largest population. Um, you know, you have sort of countries in CARICOM that has like, you know, 20,000 people, 100,000 people. So they don't have the kind of uh, capability and capacity to kind of engage in something like this. And so after a while, they really began to expand the thing. And I think um, for geopolitical reasons, that has nothing to do with Haiti per se. There was a confluence of opportunities between Kenya wanting to strengthen his relationship with the United States, um, you know, with everything that's happening in Mali and every other places, what's happening between many African countries and France and, and the European Union. This was really kind of an opportunity for both countries to engage in this partnership. And so Kenya took the leadership of leading a mission to Haiti. But the, the mission is not a Kenyan mission per se. For example, Kenya is intended to, to send a thousand police officers. Um, but Benin, for example, is willing to send 2,000, right? Um, and then, of course, there are a number of other countries in CARICOM who will be participating. And in fact, just last week, um, it was reported that Canada has begun to do training for those CARICOM police officers in Jamaica. Um, so we'll be part of that mission. So while it's called sort of the Kenyan mission, because Kenyan is, will be leading, there's got to be a country that leads the mission and Kenya will be uh, uh, in the leadership of that mission. But it's not a Kenyan mission per se. It's really, it's really a United States mission at the end of the day, um, funded and supported by the United States. Um, and hopefully there'll be some involvement in terms of not just money, but intelligence and supplies and the resources that the mission needs to execute because Kenya doesn't have those capabilities and capacity to do that. Absolutely. And I think I appreciate you making such an important distinction about how 
the the plan is oftentimes referenced and recognized in maybe popular news media versus peeling back the layers of what's actually going on behind the scenes. And as we find so many times in geopolitics, the narrative and the marketing of certain ideas or certain plans is incredibly important. Can I ask you, you know, I think it's also important to recognize, given the, the complexity of this and the role of the United States, your work in the diaspora, do you have conversations with folks about how they feel about how complex this is and the geopolitical nature of what's going to happen next? Yeah, I think for most people that I speak with, they have really no context of sort of the geopolitics that is involved in this. So people sort of look at this as, you know, um, Kenya is being used by the United States and and or Kenya is being the front for the United States. And that, you know, that's a fair enough argument for, for people to make. But the world is not that 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 simple, right? It's never really that black and white. Kenya has really strategic interests in deepening its relationship with the United States. Um, more importantly, it has strategic interest in the region where it is, right? So I often try to tell people, you know, Kenya would be analogous to the Dominican Republic next door, which is expanding sort of its presence in the region, taking on, taking on a much more of a leadership role in the region as the country that's growing the most and the fastest and wanting to project its power. And so for Kenya, this is really a power projection. Um, and at the same time, deepening its relationship with the United States, getting the military resources and intelligence and training that it needs for other reasons, right? And other reasons that are regionally focused, but also internally focused, because let's not forget Kenya has been hit twice by, so they have real reason for wanting to do this. And so there have been some pushback about the mission sort of overall, but I think what people it's hard for people to kind of reconcile what happened when the UN was in Haiti and they brought cholera, which was never in Haiti, and tens of thousands of people died as a result of that. And the UN never really took accountability for that, right? And so as a result, there are just naturally people being resistant to the idea of um, an international force, particularly one that is, even though it's under the United Nations um, uh, 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 law rules, um, nonetheless, they just feel that you know that you know those international forces have never resolved anything. And what I try to tell people is two things: one, it is up to Haitians to solve Haiti's problem. And so, whenever you have an international force that comes to your country, the purpose is not to solve your political; problem. it's to help you sort of find safety and pacify the country so that the political actors can do what they need to do. And so to that, to that end, I, I believe, and as a Haitian and many of many Haitians, you talk to others who disagree with me on this, but I think the accountability is on us for having never been able to achieve, to achieve a political settlement, the political agreement between Haitians so that we can have a country that sort of safe and be able to grow. So, so that's not on the UN despite all of the things that they've done on the other side in terms of, you know, color and everything else and abuse of young people, abuse of women and all that kind of stuff. Right. So that's those are those are really strong criticism against uh, 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 an, an external force. The second thing is I have been writing for the last two years. And indeed, I've been writing since before, you know, this all happened when actually President Moise was in power for we need to find a permanent sort of solution to both the political crisis and the social economic challenges that face Haiti. Now, one, you know, you don't have to be Nostradamus for us to see what was coming, right? And we are where we are. Um, when you look at the context of Haiti's um, security apparatus, meaning we only have the police, and we can talk about that in terms of the size of the police and its capacity to respond and secure the country. We basically, let's just take one number, is 9,000 police officers active for a country of 12 million people. You can see the problem, the math ain't mathin'. And we can talk about, it's not even 9,000, right? Today's really probably three to 4,000. And so as the gangs continue to grow and expand and they're growing and expanding is a natural progression. Like 
it's you either grow or die kind of thing because there's always going to be another gang who wants to take over your territory. And so if you take these two things, the gangs wanting to grow and expand, that means for them to grow and expand and buy weapons to do that, more kidnapping, more killing, more mass raping, more of those things. On the other hand, you don't have a force that can counteract that. The only solution is an external force that can help you do that, right? So there's no way around it. People may find for nationalist reasons why they don't like it. But at the end of the day, um, all of the people when I have this debate with them and I said, but well, fair enough. How can Haiti solve this by itself? Well, we can't, <laughs> right? And so the question is, how do you structure this in a way? And I wrote a piece, you know, probably last year to talk about this is coming. Let's just make sure we prepare and have be part of the negotiations of this mission and have an oversight of this mission. But people were so against the mission happening that they were not interested in focusing on the things that even if it wasn't going to happen, we should have been working on this to begin with. But that's that's sort of where we are. Um, there's a lot of debate in the community about this, but the reality always catches up with our nationalism. And we are where we are today with 1,500 people died in the first three months, thousands of young people raped and killed, people, 150,000 people displaced in the last few months. It's bad and bad and bad. And it's because we feel so proud that we're unwilling to, unwilling to accept help. And the situation just gets worse and worse. And it's an important point you make, though, in that in, in some cases, help is necessary, right? Outside help is necessary, as with many you know conflicts across the world. But the case that it needs to be something that is a Haitian-led plan or Haitian-led negotiations in terms of the parameters of an external force coming in to provide support is really important. And what happens next after security has been able to be maintained? I think a lot of people have talked about the issue of governance. And like I mentioned before, that there are currently no elected leaders in office right now in Haiti. And so if there is a case in which security can be you know, maintained, the violence can be quelled, what comes next for governing? Can you share with us who is governing Haiti right now? Is there any governance taking place? Is there any leadership taking place in the country right now? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> and there hasn't been any real <laughs> governance for the last 30 months when um, Prime Minister Ariel took over. And it's been really amazing to me that um, a group of people could take over a country um, to be in government and have been simply not just absent, but to some extent, their cynicism and their disregard for the population. I mean, government's first role is to is the safety of your people. That's that's a, a, above and every everything else. That's the role of your people. They just simply did not care, or or you know maybe they felt like they could not really uh, stem the growth of the gangs and whatnot. But it just got to the point where you felt like they really had no regard for the people. Like if, you know, you would hear that the gangs went into a neighborhood and, you know, they kill 50, 60 people, they burn dozens of homes, and the government never reacted, never a tweet, never a community, a nothing. And then you would you would hear that Prince Charles had a toothache um, in England, and then the prime minister would tweet about that, you know, and you just sort of like, you know, the, the complete disregard. So the country just has not been governed. That said, at the very least, right, um, whether people like Prime Minister Henry or not, he was the person that an elected president under the Constitution um, placed or chose as the prime minister. So I think for a very long time, the United States supported him because he had sort of a a 5%, 10% legitimacy, unlike everybody else, right? Um, and unfortunately, he squandered that. Um, today, there's just no one, right? So we have a de facto government. Ariel is stuck here in the United States. I think he's actually out west. I believe he went to Los Angeles. You know, he tendered his resignation um, pending a new uh, presidential council that would take over. But the folks that are in Haiti now, the ministers that are in Haiti now are playing games with that. So that's a completely different kind of thing. All that to say that the country is an autopilot and autopilot means that the gangs are continual, 
are continuing to strengthen themselves for good reasons because they're very strategic. They know that if a force is coming, first of all, they want to project power. Um, secondly, they want to take as much territory as possible so that they can have something to negotiate back. And so there is a natural strategic movement by the gangs to make it appear as a place that is unmanageable. That is, you if you come here, not only are we ready to fight you because we have sophisticated weapons to do so, but this is going to be urban warfare. And we're ready for you. So we encourage you to not come uh, um, and let's find a negotiated solution with the gangs. So that's where we are right now. The country is not being governed by anybody. It's every poor person for themselves right now. Now, that said, there is so the rural areas are much safer, not completely safer. But I should always say that Haiti is not only Port-au-Prince, which is where most of the problem is. I also don't want to minimize the fact that when something affects Port-au-Prince, it affects the rest of the country. And the fact that gangs, like I said earlier, are expanding. So they're not just in, in the West region where Port-au-Prince is. Um, they're also expanding to other departments like Tartibonite, which is the second largest um, uh, department in Haiti. And so they're very active in the, the two largest departments of the, the, the 10th department that Haiti has. I think sometimes that goes missed in maybe popular news conversations. And you mentioned this element of control and gangs having the ability to negotiate right territory in order to have something at the negotiating table in terms of what might happen next. And sometimes what often does not go talked about is the role of elites, folks who are not necessarily in office. Is there anything you can share with us in terms of the role of elites in the country now and their relationship with the gangs and the government? Sure. I mean, it's documented and some of them have given interviews, oddly enough. I mean, it's this crazy thing that you sort of someone would would give talk to a journalist and talk about how they used to pay gangs to protect their businesses, of course, sort of in a good light. Like, you know, if we don't, they might destroy our businesses. Of course, of, of, also what happens and what has been documented is the fact that they used to pay the gangs to control um, uh, who can enter in a, into a particular business. In other words, if, you know, somebody has control of a sector, um, if anybody else wanted to enter into that sector, um, they would use the gang to make it impossible for you to do business. Right. And so that is fundamentally where the problem begins. There are two groups of people. One is the economic elite who really funded the gangs to either protect their turf and or to expand it. The second was the politicians. And that is one that I've seen personally. The economic elite, I can't, except for the sort of the documented things that's been published, um, I could not say that I've seen it personally. But on the on the political end, that I've seen um, um, politicians, um, a lot of them that were either in the Senate or in the, the chamber, the lower house, essentially not just paying for votes, but paying young men, arming young men, to um, suppress the vote or to force people to vote for them. So that really is at the root of where this all began. And I think that often, and again, I'm I'm probably an outlier for this because I like to look at things from the perspective of the, the world is not black and white, but certainly I think we need to take accountability for things that we've done and things that the international community has done to us. Um, those two things are not mutually exclusive to get us to where we are. Um, but I, I am less focused on, I'm going to change the United States, which is focused on its pro projecting its power and protecting its interests. I want to do that. But first, I need to make sure that we Haitian do what we need to do in Haiti. So we need to be accountable for our economic elite and political elite who not only created, um, but also sustained till today. Um, the gangs that are active in Haiti. And it's a great point you make in following up on that, the importance of a Haitian-led agenda, as well as the intersection of politics and security, which, like you've said, is kind of the crux of a lot of where the current situation has been has originated. Can you share with us, Bibi, what might be on the table for next steps for establishing governance in Haiti if a secure environment is able to be established, 
what are the options and what are the options that Haitians or Haitian-led agenda would be looking for? Sure. So I would say representative political parties and civil society organizations under the sort of the oversight or under the collaborations with CARICOM have been able to negotiate an agreement to create a transit presidential council. Though so that council is supposed to have seven members, which represent all of the different political, you know, major political parties, um, as well as um, civil society and two observers. So it has nine members. And this is where um, we're stuck right now. It's been a month since um, each of those groups have nominated who they wanted to be on this uh, presidential council and waiting now for President Ariel in the the current um, set of ministers to essentially publish this officially in the Monitor, which is the um, the official newspaper. Really, this is a way to ensure that there is a minimum set of legal uh, 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 coverage for this new presidential council taking office. Um, they, once they are in office, will select a president and then each of them will be able to uh, propose a prime minister um, and the top three, there'll be an election. And then if there's after two or three votes, they can't agree on one. Um, one will be selected by, you know, you simply put the names in the box and pick one out, right, of the three. Um, I think that, you know, for many of those folks who are um, part of the uh, uh, this uh, transition presidential council, um, you know, they've proposed some ideas of how they would want to govern, but we will have to wait to see what the final agreement, because we don't we don't know. They're still negotiating on what that um, that uh, agreement, the final agreement between them or the governance agreement with, between them would be. Uh, but we know that their focus would be, number one, on security, number two, on election, number three, um, and not necessarily, the order would be security, um, election, they would want to revise the, the constitution. So maybe the constitution comes first and then elections. And then they have sort of segments that each of the groups will carry, the economy, health, education, infrastructure, and those kinds of things, because um, those are aligned with different ministries. Um, and so that's kind of the structure that they're putting in place. Now, as far as security, my personal proposal had been all along is that if there is going to be, not if, knowing that there was going to be international force, I had proposed um, sort of an approach where we Haitians always serve um, at the, as the tip of the spear is what I call it, meaning that um, Haitian uh, special forces, which are being trained right now by the United States and are the ones who can really take that fight um, to the gangs. And when they do, they actually do a very good job. The problem is there's not enough of them. Um, and once they go in, they do an intervention, um, they can't stay because there are so few of them. So, you know, if you strengthen that force as one layer that sort of take the fight to to the gangs, um, then you have the international force that would be there to supplement and support, providing intelligence, providing air support, not necessarily to drop any bombs or anything like that, but, you know, with drones and those kinds of things to make sure that you sort of knew the movement of 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 the enemy no support for it. operational yes. support especially yeah. um so that would happen sort of you know on on, on the immediate uh um when when they sort of face to face with um with the enemy but once you do that you need to secure the space and i think um the regular police should come in and i was always concerned that if you just send the regular police there back into the police station without some accompaniment two things could happen. One is that they can also go back and begin to abuse those communities where their fellow police officers that, you know, have, have been murdered um, or just essentially abuse the population for other reasons. So I think it's always helpful to have a counterbalance, a, a counterbalance there. Um, and then uh, lastly, I've always suggested that you kind of really nationalize the um, mm -hmm. 
uh, the private security companies. There's uh, 75, the last estimate between 75 and 90,000. Wow. And the reason I had proposed that at the time, there was a movement called Bois Calais in Haiti, which is which was a movement where the population would lynch people that they believed were gang members. Um, and there was a big push to essentially say, let's arm the population to defend itself. I, I, I never thought that this was a good idea. And in a place where we are saying there's far too many guns on the street, um, to put guns in the hands of people who are untrained, but more importantly, who not part of an, any hierarchy, is essentially asking for trouble, essentially a civil war of, of, of sort. So, you know, using the private security firms, um, essentially nationalizing them, you have a group of people who've got a limited, small amount of training, um, who are used to having a hierarchy, taking order from from a hierarchy, and who could still play a role that fits within the context of what they do today. The only additional thing that they would do is that there would be a direct link with the security system so that if there is a problem, they wouldn't be calling their office. They would be calling sort of a central place that could say gangs are coming in this area, you know, send backup of those, or those kinds of things, right? Now, there's folks who are concerned about that. And I understand those concern in terms of people saying, you don't want to put that power that kind of power into the hands of one person or, you know, a president. And because of experiences that we've had, obviously, with Duvalier and others. Um, and those are fair uh, concerns. I think we just need to figure out the right way to do that. The core of my principle, though, is that um, security in Haiti has to be fought for by Haitians with support of others versus others fighting for Haitians' freedom, right? Um, and And I think we could do it. Um, and I think that we need external support to do it. Um, again, as I said before, the math for us ain't mathing, and there's no way to do it if we don't have external support. And so that's how, that's sort of the, the the advocacy I've been I've been pushing in terms of the the security governance structure in in, in Haiti. And I think you know folks have been hearing it. Um, I hear folks talk about it sometimes on different uh, on different um, debates. And, and I look forward to seeing what comes out of what the uh, the presidential council um, decides. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's it, it's interesting as well because you you draw some important, I think, distinctions in terms of recognizing that, like you say, and this is not these are not black and white issues. There's a lot of gray. There's a lot of complexity, and recognizing where we need to take that into account in terms of what next steps are, but also recognizing that sometimes it is about the fundamentals. Sometimes the math ain't math. And like you said, in terms of the, how security forces on the ground can maintain a completely outsized gang forces, that's not going to happen. So really understanding the right mix of fundamentals and getting back to basics as well as how gray and complex these issues are is important. I do appreciate you being here with us. And I want to ask you two more quick questions about your perspective before we let you go. And the first being is, and maybe this is something that we just covered a bit, but what, if anything, would you like the world and international actors who are part of these decision-making processes from external actors to understand or do differently in approaching the crisis and long-term development for Haiti? I'll start with the latter. I mean, I think for the long-term development for Haiti, economic development, creation of jobs has been um, the crux of the problems in Haiti. I mean, you have a majority of people that have been excluded, and this exclusion is not new. It's exclusion that have been around since the the country's founding, right? This is not new. Um, it it has been um, exacerbated both by when the U.S. left Haiti in 1934. Um, you know, they spent from 1915 to 1934, 29 years. They really centralized everything. Um, so you have a country where the majority lives in the rural areas. Um, you have a country where paying of the debt was done in the back of those people in the rural areas, but yet all of the country's sort of um, commercial, political, social um, infrastructures are centralized in Port-au-Prince. So everything has to be done in Port-au-Prince. So I think you know economic development, job creation is important um, with a focus on. For me, I think focus in the rural areas and particularly on women. I think that has been um, um, hindrance. I always tell people it's like you know running a race against um, um, 
Usain Bolt with your arm tied behind your back and cutting one of your legs um, on purpose. It's 50% of the population, 53% of the population, but yet they have no voice. So there's got to be a real focus on make sure that there's participation of women in this in these um in, in these structures and processes. I think that as on the first part of the question, I think as people think about, you know, particularly those who are in, this, in position of decision making, I wrote a piece the other day to sort of recommend that we need to kind of flip the script. I think the focus right now people have is to think about elections from a national elections perspective. I believe that the, the issues that we face have been so deeply rooted and the exclusions have been so long in the making that in order to sort of um, tackle them, we need to be very uh, 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 purposeful. And so what I recommend is that if we're going to do election within a push elections, I believe we need to start elections at the local level first. Instead of national election, really begin at the local level so that you begin to put the structures at the local level, people at the local level are represented, and could actually begin to meet the requirements that exist in the Constitution in terms of representation. So that by the time you get to national election, you already have the infrastructure that engages the people at the local level from the Azek, Kazakhs, and, and those are sort of like you, your community boards and Oh, another emergency alert. Having a priority on on rural areas and, and women, you begin to build that ground so that by the time you get to, you're going to do elections, well, first of all, you're going to do a referendum on the constitution. But by the time you get to, you know, election for senators and deputies and president, all of the infrastructure for the the, the rural communities was already there. And they can have their representative be part of that process. Um, so that's what I would recommend for those who are in position of power, who can influence what happens to some extent. Because I think if we go through that process the way that we've always done, and I think there is an urgency to have election because we need representative government, we're simply going to repeat the exact same errors, which then continues the exclusion of the great majority of people. So that really is a way to not only deconcentrate and decentralize not just infrastructure and power, but also political power and have it across the country. Absolutely. You know, your point to maintaining a gendered lens, recognizing the role of a Haitian-led agenda, as well as the sequence of going from the local up to the national and making sure some of the institutional elements are in place are incredibly important. Johnny, thank you for having this conversation with me today. I, I have a feeling that many of our listeners will be quite enlightened by the insight that you've had. So thank you for bringing important themes within the crisis right now in Haiti to our listeners. Thank you so much. And I'll just tell folks if they want to see some of the stuff that I've written, you know, first, a lot of it is on my LinkedIn page, but I also write for the Haitian paper, uh, Aibo Pos, and many of these ideas uh, are also there. But thank you so much for the invitation. I was really happy to, to be part of this conversation with you. Thank you. Johnny is currently a deputy director in the New York City's Mayor's Office of Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprises. He is also a faculty member at the Studley Graduate Program in International Affairs at the New School University. He has extensive leadership and global experience in international development, governance, leadership, and community development. He has over 30 years of experience in the private and public phil and philanthropic sectors. And Johnny is an active member of various civil society organizations in Haiti and the United States, including the Haitian Center for Leadership and Excellence in Defend Haiti's Democracy. This was 37th in the World the official podcast of the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs. Please be sure to subscribe and leave a comment and rating on whichever streaming platform you use. To support the podcast, you can click the link in this podcast's description that says support the show. To read other insightful interviews and articles, please check out gajia.georgetown.edu.